When we install a car audio system, we need to make sure that we use crossovers in order to limit the frequencies of sound playing through each of our speakers. We do this for a couple of reasons, the first of which is to protect our speakers. As an example, this tweeter here can be damaged almost immediately if we were to play bass frequencies through it. We also do it to optimize our system as each speaker excels at playing different frequencies. These larger speakers would play our mid-range frequencies and then the tweeters play our highs. Now in order to limit the frequencies going to each of our speakers with a crossover, we can use the passive crossovers that come with the speakers or we can use the crossover setting in the software for our digital signal processor. But herein lies the question, if we can set our crossover on a DSP, why would we still have passive crossovers as part of the system? And if we are still using passive crossovers with a DSP, what is the best way to tune the DSP with these in order to get the best sound? So in this video, I'm going to explain why you might wanna still use your passive crossovers even if you have a DSP, and I'm gonna show you how to set up the DSP correctly with not only crossovers, but also time alignment and equalization when you are keeping passive crossovers in your system. Before we get into this, I do wanna take a quick second to thank our monthly channel sponsor, Audio Control, and tell you a little bit about their DSP lineup. So in this video to help teach you guys, I'm gonna be using the DM810 digital signal processor, but there is also another standalone DSP in the audio control lineup, the DM-608. What I really like about both these DSPs and the DSP software that is built into Audio Control's D series of amplifiers is that they give you the ability to analyze the electrical signal coming into the device. This is very important because in a lot of modern vehicles, in order to bring in the signal from the factory system of the car, we need to be able to analyze and see if it's a full range signal or if the signal is limited and if we need to sum different parts of the signal together. In order to analyze Analyze that electrical signal with some of the other DSPs on the market, you would have to have a high-end piece of test gear, but with the audio control devices, it's built in so we can see the signal right away and we know what we need to do. You can learn more about the audio control lineup at the links down in the video description. So getting into this, I'm not sure why, but whenever I use a DSP here on the channel and I also use passive crossovers as part of the system design, the question always comes up. Why would you use a passive crossover when you have a DSP? And I think a lot of the mindset here is that, you know, the DSP is the most advanced new technology and the passive crossovers, those are in old technology as people might say. So I think the mindset is, well, you have the new technology, why would you also use the old technology? Allow me to explain with this example system set up right here. So first of all, let's say that we have our digital signal processor, and this is what we're using to take the signal from our factory head unit or our aftermarket head unit, and we're gonna convert that high speaker level signal, and we're gonna send it to our amplifiers as an RCA output, but we're also going to obviously control that signal using the DSP software. We then have our two amplifiers here. We have a four channel amplifier for our speakers and a subwoofer amplifier for the subwoofer. Now, this is a four channel amplifier, meaning we're going to have our front component speakers. So this is in the front left door. This is in the front right door. And then in the back left door, we're gonna have a six by nine. In the back right door, we're gonna have another six by nine. So those are the rear speakers. And then we of course have our subwoofer. This is where people get confused. If we take out these passive crossovers, and we have all these speakers with these two amps. There is no good way to power all of these speakers with these amps. Now, why is that? Well, that's because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven channels that we need of amplification. But let's see how many channels we actually have here. We have one, two, three, four, five channels total. That means that we're two channels short. So the way that we solve this issue is we bring in our passive crossovers. Now what we can do is we can take the first channel out of this amplifier, go into the passive crossover, and now we have two outputs out of this crossover going to our woofer and our tweeter. And of course, our crossover here is going to limit the bandwidth of information going to each speaker. So that's just channel one that is now powering two speakers. And we can do the same thing on channel two. It's now powering two speakers. So that leaves channels three and four freed up to do our six by nine coaxial in the back on each side, and then of course our subwoofer amplifier powering the subwoofer. So this raises the question, if we have one, two, three, four, five, six different speakers, 
why wouldn't you use a six channel amplifier? Well, the reason is sometimes the budget doesn't allow for it. You might not have enough budget for a six channel amplifier. You might not have the space for a six channel amplifier. You might not have enough of an electrical power supply with your stock alternator, so you wanna use less power and less channels. There's always a trade off with everything when it comes to system design, and there's a lot of systems that only have four channels to work with, and if you wanna keep those back speakers, you're going to need to run the front components passive. And if you're asking yourself, why would I have a DSP as part of a budget system? I would actually recommend that you get a DSP before you upgrade to going active. In my opinion, you can get a lot better results with a properly tuned DSP controlled system rather than just having a six channel system that doesn't have the DSP. So if we've decided that we do wanna keep our passive crossovers for our component speakers in the front of the vehicle in this example, how do we properly tune everything on the DSP. We're gonna get into that, but just for clarity's sake, for the rest of this video, let's just focus only on these front component speakers. Let's take the rest of this out of the equation, and let's just say that we're worried about using those first two channels on our amplifier for our component speakers. And let's say that these tweeters are mounted up in the sail panel on each door, and that these woofers are down in the lower area of the door in a normal location. To better explain this, let's get on the computer here and dive in to our DSP software. So I'm currently connected to a DM810 and much like the example that I described to you guys, let's say that we have our front component speakers coming out on channels one and two of this DSP, which is going to channels one and two on that four channel amplifier. Then we're using channels three and four for those rear coaxial speakers and then seven and eight for our subwoofers. Since we're focusing on the channels that have that passive crossover, we're gonna focus just on these outputs here, one and two. The first category I wanna talk about here is what do you do with the crossover? Because obviously you have that passive crossover on the speakers. So the way that you need to look at this now is imagine that those component speakers are basically a coaxial set in terms of what we need to do for our crossover. What this means is the woofer and the tweeter in that component set are part of the set. So we want to give it both woofer range frequencies, but also tweeter range frequencies. So on our signal here, we're gonna let it play all the way up to 20,000 Hertz for our tweeter. But what we are concerned about is where we're gonna hand off on our mid range speaker, that larger of the two speakers to our subwoofer. In this case, let's say that we're going to use 80 Hertz. So I'll type that in there. And if you guys are curious on how to determine what value you should use for your crossovers, I do have a full dedicated video about that here on the channel. So the point is we're treating this a lot like a coaxial speaker. We're sending it 80 Hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz. And then obviously that passive crossover is going to do what it needs to do in order to divide up that signal. The next section we wanna focus on is our time delay. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the reason for time delay in a vehicle is the speed of sound is actually relatively slow. The speaker that is over in the passenger door is further away from our listening position than the speaker in the driver door. So what that means is that the sound from the driver door is actually going to arrive at our listening position before the passenger door. This can lead to issues with the imaging of the sound, phase issues. We wanna make sure that at our listening position, everything is arriving at the same time. Now where this becomes difficult is we are actually setting the time delay for four total speakers because there's two on each of those passive crossovers. So on this DSP, the way that we enter our time delay values are we are actually gonna take a measurement and you could switch it to metric units, but in this case, we're gonna take a measurement in inches. We're going to be measuring from the listening position to the cone of our speaker. But when using a passive crossover, this becomes a question. Do we need to measure to the mid range, that six and a half inch speaker, or do we need to measure to the tweeter? In my most recent video, I talked about the way that we as humans actually hear, and I talked about interaural time difference. And that is what our brain uses basically to determine the localization of sounds based on time. Now with smaller speakers, it is really more difficult for our brain to localize those sounds because those wavelengths are so small, it's hard for us to detect the phase relationship difference. But when we start to get into larger speakers that are playing lower frequencies that have that longer wavelength, that time difference becomes more important. So we want to 
time delay to the larger speaker. We want to measure to the larger speaker that is part of that component set. So in our example, we said that that six and a half inch speaker are down in the doors. So let's say that on the left side of the vehicle I measured and it was 36 inches. And let's say I measured to the right and it was a little bit further. It was 45 and a half inches. I can just go ahead and enter those values. By entering these values, the DSP is gonna do all the math to correct everything once we enter all the values for all the different speakers and subwoofers. Now, the next main thing that we're gonna to wanna to tune on our DSP is this right here, the equalizer. To start this process, we're going to play pink noise on our system. Pink noise sounds a lot like static, but it's essentially equal energy at every octave of frequency. So by doing that, we're playing the pink noise and we're going to listen with an RTA microphone to take a measurement. And then based on that measurement, we're going to come in and either boost or cut that particular frequency. As an example, let's say right here at around one kilohertz, let's say that our measurement on our RTA microphone was telling us it was about two decibels too loud. So what we could do is come here to 1K and we can go down 2 dB and we generally would want to monitor our microphone while we're making these adjustments. The question at hand though is because this is a component set of speakers and we're technically tuning this single output that's going to two different speakers, is there anything different we need to do on the EQ? And the answer is you want to treat this essentially just like it's a normal coaxial speaker. Since you have that passive crossover and you're sending everything from around 80 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz, you're going to EQ all of this just like you normally would. Now there is something to watch out for. Let's say that that passive crossover, just as an example, has a crossover point of 3,500 hertz, so 3.5 kilohertz. In that case, when you're tuning that area on the EQ, you're really going to want to pay attention to how your adjustment of the EQ is being reflected on your measurement microphone. If you're making big changes, like let's say that you see a hump there near the crossover point and you're really dropping this EQ down quite a bit and you're not seeing that change that you're making in the DSP software being reflected with what you're actually measuring acoustically, then it's likely due to that crossover point in that area. If that happens, what I recommend that you do is just make some smaller changes and then switch over to your opposite side of the vehicle. And you're going to just try to get that dip or that hump to match on your measurement response. It doesn't always have to be perfectly flat or perfectly match a target curve. What's important is that our left performance and our right performance closely match each other so that we get a nice perfect stereo image. If you would like to learn more about tuning a DSP, I have two recommended videos for you. One is focused on how to properly set all of your time alignment or time delay values. And the other is focused on how to use an RTA, a real time analyzer, in order to tune the equalizer on the DSP. Next time you need an easy to tune DSP, definitely check out show sponsor Audio Controls. Line up at the links down in the video description. A special thanks to them, along with Bryson, Mike Ali, Jerry, Marcos, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. A big thank Thanks to all those guys for making these videos possible. And as always, thank you guys for watching.